Welcome to the History of Sexuality Volume 4 course. In this class, we will talk about the third and the last part of the second chapter of the book entitled Virginity and Knowledge of Self. In this part, Foucault will talk about the direction of virginal life based on a text from Eastern Christianity written by Basilius of Ancyra entitled the integrity of virginity, which is a text that is very directed to women as virgins. And he will also speak of texts by Cassian, where this author of monasticism will speak to the question of purity in monastic existence. They are two very different authors, however, who work on issues of techniques of self in their relationship with virginity. About Basilios, Foucault will talk about how this author sees bodily sexual differences as an impediment, as a difficulty for those who want to access God's love and who, for that, need to break away from all bodily affections. For Basilios, the search for purity must be of the soul and the body. But for him, the soul is the first and determining element. If the soul is not pure, the body will not be either. There is a hierarchy here of the soul in relation to the body. The work of purifying the soul becomes a constant work. Every thought is seen as an act in the soul, so purification must be constantly carried out in relation to the subtlest movements of thought. Says Foucault, citation, The soul that wants to remain virgin must therefore continually watch over even the most secret movements of its thought. Finally, the purity of the soul cannot be ensured without constant vigilance over what within itself may cause illusion and deceive it. End of citation. So one is asked to look and to have a constant attention to any movement that takes place in thought, and purification requires paying attention to any movement that might be malicious. A movement of thought can come as a cause of illusion, and this illusion would be that of the cunning enemy of Satan, of the devil, the person who seeks to remain in the state of purity must then be in a constant practice of relating to himself, a relation not only of attention to the movements of the body, but the relations of body and soul and the agitation of thoughts. The practice of virginity will then be a type of internal knowledge of everything that can escape one and others. At the same time, it's a relationship with the power of the other, with the gaze of the other, a subjection of the individual and an objectification of his interiority. There will not be a full identification here with either the body or the soul because both are crossed and traversed by dangers that need to be visualized and faced. In Basilio's analysis, the exclusion of sexual relations takes on a positive spiritual meaning as a result of the refusal of anything that can be a means to the illusion and error that are tempted by the enemy, by evil. Foucault then goes on to speak of Cassian's writings. He mentions that this author rarely uses the term virginity, 
which was common to other priests such as Gregory of Nyssa, Basilius or Chrysostom as we saw. The term used by Cassian is chastity. He will distinguish continence from chastity. Continence refers to being chaste in a bodily way in relation to sexual intercourse, for example. But for Cassian, being chaste comes to mean maintaining a state of integrity or incorruptibility, which in Greek is called hagnos, a state of purity, of virginity in flesh and spirit, a whole state of purity, says Cassian. Citation. The incorruption of the flesh resides less in the deprivation of a woman than in the integrity of the heart that preserves sanctity for the fear of God or the love of chastity without corruption. End of citation. So let's see here then that for Cassian, the integrity of the heart is more important than the incorruption of the flesh. Chastity appears as a positive force. It allows those who practice it to take delight, to take even a certain pleasure from their own purity. For Cassian, the subject lives an internal combat because of the assaults of the flesh. One is constantly threatened, but this constant threat is a good thing because that way the subject is always attentive, always in combat. This combat has the movement of expelling from the heart the appetites of the flesh and thus giving way to spiritual joys. What's interesting here is that he puts that this combat is a combat that must include a great desire and a great love for chastity, for this purity of heart and for the spiritual combat. So it is imbued with desire. It's not a, a total renunciation of desire. Foucault will then speak of purity of heart, saying that when Cassian speaks of the state of virginity, he does not use the vocabulary of engagement with God, union with God, a wedding with God that was so present even before him. Cassian speaks of merging with God, but as an act of knowledge, not as a sexual relation or sexual union of two individuals. Cassian speaks of the relationship between gaze, object and light. Knowledge, says Foucault, citation. For Cassian, the soul linked to God is not the bride finally reunited with her husband. Rather, it is the gaze that is not distracted from the point at which it has been fixed and clings to it to the point where it no longer sees. When he speaks of the soul that merges with God, Cassian does not think of the absolute wife in spiritual union, but in the act of contemplation that is no longer more than one, it is the same thing with what is contemplated. As for the presence of God in the soul, he takes possession of it without letting anything escape. It is not the presence of the Lord on the nuptial bed that Cassian refers to, but the ray of light that descends into the soul and illuminates it, leaving no corner in it, of no shadow at all. End of citation.
Here we see how Foucault is poetic in creating an interpretive language of the reading he makes of another author. This interpretive language acts with a certain respect for what it interprets. But that's just one observation of mine. What Cashin's work is showing is that it refers to a goal of contemplation for life, which was the goal of monastic life. It was a life of renunciation of the world in order to reach the good which is contemplation. This contemplation is a relationship with the knowledge of God. It's a relationship of knowledge of God. A relationship that takes place in the interior of the soul that is illuminated from within by divine grace in a spiritual fusion, a possession in the form of knowledge. Says Foucault, citation, Chastity does not have the same role for him as virginity among the authors we spoke of earlier. For them, it was a question of preserving in the soul the integrity which it allows to reach the bridegroom without ever having suffered blemish. For Cassian, chastity has the role of ensuring a purity of heart or a purity of spirit that makes the relationship of knowledge possible, that there is no disturbance in the gaze, no shadow that escapes the light, no stain that hinders the transparency. In short, the series Virginity, Integrity, Spiritual Nuptials, which we find clearly developed in authors such as Basil of Ancyra, Cassian in the manner of Evagrius, replaces the series Chastity, Purity of Art, Contemplation. End of citation. For Cassian, the understanding of the word of the scriptures only happens to one who starts practicing corporeal chastity and then goes on to practice Chastity in the sense of the spirit. Purity of heart is attained through the soul that pays attention to continuing upon itself a constant vigilance that never stops. He who becomes purer, the better knows himself. And the more he knows, the more he recognizes himself as impure, and so he can go on to bring in the light that dispels the darkness of the soul. Knowledge of oneself, for Cassian, is the knowledge of one's impurities, and it is at the same time what makes possible an openness to the spiritual that can reach even the contemplation of God, says Foucault. Citation. We must therefore conceive of the double process of exposure to the light of the arcana of the heart, which is at the same time a condition and an effect of the knowledge of God and of a journey towards spiritual science that cannot be done without a knowledge of the self that it makes possible. And at the point of articulation of these two processes, chastity, end of citation. Chastity is then both a necessary condition of contemplation and the reward for the enjoyment of purity resulting from the knowledge of God. Foucault will then talk about spiritual combat in Cassian. And he will say that this spiritual struggle is presented with metaphors of the athletic model and the military model. Says Foucault, citation, The intertwining of these two metaphors brings out two essential components of spiritual combat. 
on the one hand, as an athletic test, this combat presupposes exercise, training, the will to overcome oneself, work on oneself, control and measure one's own strength, assesses in the strict sense of the term. But as a war against an opponent, and even more a tireless enemy susceptible to all tricks than a rival in honest play, the fight takes place against another. Athletic combat imposes a way of relating to oneself. Warlike, it is a relationship with an irreducible element of otherness. End of citation. This other against which the combat is waged is presented by Cassian in the forms of sins with like gluttony, fornication, avarice, anger, sadness, acidia, boasting, pride. Foucault says that here we have a sketch of the picture that will later become the seven capital sins. But he stresses here it is not about establishing codes of faults or interdictions, but rather a typology of thought. Those thoughts that stir up the soul and disturb its tranquility. It is the demons that insinuate these thoughts into our bodies and souls, according to Cassian, and that this would depend on us whether or not to dwell on them, letting them have our passions or not. For Cassian, Demons are spirits, such as the spirit of gluttony, the spirit of greed, etc. They cannot dwell in the soul, but they can settle in the body, especially in the weakened body. Through the body, they arouse and induce thoughts, images, memories, etc. And we can be deceived into thinking that it is from each one of us that these are coming and the devil can see how the soul reacts to such insinuations and with that information he can modify them intensify them can change his attack says Foucault citation it is in short a complex game between the soul and its opponent in which thoughts are sent repealed accepted relaunched again through the body that launches and receives movements. In these, the enemy detects the signs that guide his action, and it is also in them that the soul must recognize the signs of his adversary's presence. Spiritual combat is therefore inseparably a confrontation with the other, a dynamic of movements that pass from the soul to the body and vice versa, a task of deciphering, finally, trying to capture what is hidden under the appearances of oneself. End of citation. See that here we have a whole genealogy of the subject of Western culture, that subject who will interpret his interiority in search of science and will deal with his interiority as a game of appearances. The spiritual combat takes place precisely in deciphering the signs of the body and soul, but the decipherment is never finished. The combat only ceases, at least momentarily, with the interference and help of God. The one who believes that he is already sheltered from evil is precisely the one who can relapse because of his overconfidence, according to Cassian. Says Foucault, citation, It would be then that the different force could, by surprise, defeat him without even leaving the 
him the possibility of resisting. There is, therefore, a positive value in the permanent and intense combat. We must, therefore, see in this perpetual and sensitive threat of evil a benefit. Hence, an effect of God's beneficence. The war that crosses us, says Cassian, I say that it is the effect of a divine providence. Thus, the war that a disposition of the Creator sparks in us has its usefulness in a certain way. It excites us, it forces us to become better. And if it came to an end, we would see a disastrous peace come to it. End of citation. This is where the notion of temptation plays a fundamental role. It is the dynamic element in the relationship between the outside and the inside of the soul. It is also the dramatic episode in combat because it can drag us towards it or away from it. And it is what needs to be deciphered as to its origin in God or on the devil. Temptation is precisely this notion that calls for the need for continuous decipherment for knowledge of self. Foucault shows how Cassian believes in a causal chain of what he considered as the evil spirits, such as the spirit of gluttony, the spirit of fornication, of avarice, etc. In this causal chain, gluttony, the consumption of many foods, ignites the spirit of fornication. Then these two ignite greed, which give rise to disputes and anger, which thus bring the spirits of sadness, which in turn would bring all the disgust of uh, life and acidia, and then a deep melancholy as the last spirit. So Cassian placed an ascetic importance on fasting, because that would be to take out evil from its roots before gluttony could ignite the spirit of fornication and so on. The spirit of fornication for Cassian has an ontological difference from other vices, because unlike uh, gluttony, which is based on a need that is uh, corporeal, uh, that is for food and cannot be totally suppressed, fornication also comes from the body, but for Cassian, it must be the object of a radical modification. The goal for Cassian is, citation, to come out of the flesh while remaining in the body, end of citation. The goal is to live in this world a life that is no longer of this world. But for Cassian, fornication does not directly refer to sexual relations. It's rather a relationship of interiority. When he speaks of chastity, he does not list the different possible sins according to the act committed by the person, his age, his sex, or kinship relations that may be had with others. There is no codification of acts as later Christianity had in the Middle Ages with its codification of all the sins of lust. Says Foucault, citation, If Cassian's analyses omit sexual intercourse, if they develop in such a lonely world and in such an interior scene, it is not simply for a negative reason. The essence of the fight against chastity is aimed at a target that is not related to the act or the relationship. 
it is to another reality where there is no sexual relationship between two individuals. In other words, for Cashin, the interiority of the subject is the place for the most fundamental combat. And if this subject comes to give in to the spirit of fornication, it's because he's already lost the inner combat. This inner combat would be the one that would prevent the affectation even of sleep by the sin of the flesh. Cashin describes six stages of spiritual combat and the advancement of chastity, but on those I will not go into detail here, they are in the book. The important thing here is to note uh, this difference that Cashin presents in relation to ancient philosophers or to early Christians like Clement of Alexandria. For Cashin, fornication came to refer to a process of interiority. All this work of undoing the subject's involvement in all the movements of the body and soul uh, connected voluntarily or involuntarily to the sins of the flesh, Cashin calls concupiscence. It is against concupiscence that the subject must wage spiritual combat and seek to dissociate himself. This dissociation begins with voluntary acts, but gives signs that it has actually arrived when the subject no longer has nocturnal pollution, ejaculation, or voluptuous dreams. Chastity, this purity, shows itself present and stronger precisely when even the most involuntary is reached. Sleeping is the time when everything that was hidden during the day appears, that is, if the subject ate excessively, or had impure thoughts during the day, concupiscence will show itself in dreams or in nocturnal pollution, involuntary ejaculation. And again, the issue arises that victory in spiritual combat is not just the subject's merit, the individual's merit, but rather a conjunction of his combat work together with divine grace. The one who boasts of being victorious in combat can always fall back because victory is only given by grace for Cushion. Grace appears as a power stronger than nature. Foucault points to the difference that Cushion introduces in relation to what was the mystique of virginity in Tertullian that we saw in earlier chapters, says Foucault, citation. In Tertullian, the state of virginity implied an exterior and interior attitude of renunciation of the world, complemented by rules of presentation, conduct, and way of being. In the great mystique of virginity that develops from the third century onwards, the rigor of renunciation on the theme already present in Tertullian of union with Christ inverts the negative form of continence into a promise of spiritual marriage. In Cassian, who once again is a witness much more than an inventor, there is something like an unfolding, a kind of portrait that opens up the full depth of an interior scene. End of citation. So let's see, Cushion is important in presenting a new type of subject that has a whole depth, uh, new interiority, new techniques of the self that appear as spiritual combat, central to the monastic life. It is not about 
interdictions or prohibitions that that have been would have been internalized but rather the opening of a domain that is thought which goes from body to soul and from soul to body the subject then becomes always suspicious a suspicion against himself that is constant and never disarms he seeks to detect all secret fornication in the deepest recesses of the soul the subject is produced by a subjectivation a continuous practice and obligation to seek and tell the truth about oneself an indefinite and endless practice. This subject will try to detect in himself the strength of the other, of the enemy that hides within himself. He will fight a combat that cannot be won without the help of omnipotence, of God. And at the same time, he must submit to another permanently, to obey his directors of conscience. This subject will be subjectified through all of these practices. So we have here, again, a certain genealogy of Western forms of subjectivation. That's all for this class. In the next class, we will go to part three of the book. Happy reading. See you then.